All right, let's, let's think about this. And to think about it, we're going to go back to this diagram. So rather than a fish, this is a coin. The light from the coin comes up. It hits your eye and makes it look like the coin is over there. So now if you're going to shoot a laser to hit the object, where do you shoot it? Well, if you shoot a laser back down exactly where it appears to be coming from, it will hit the coin. <laughs> How many answered A for the last one? Uh, a good fraction of you, but that's the right answer. All right, now, uh, what happens when we're looking at an object like this? It's just a piece of glass, right? Light goes through it, right? It's pretty transparent to light. So why do we see it at all? Well, the light that's hitting the surface is being refracted, and then it hits the other surface. So, you know, what you're seeing is a complicated set of things where the light coming from behind this makes it into your eye somehow. And you only see it, even though it's transparent to light, you only see it because the surface is bent and, and you know, has the lip and so forth on it. Well, uh, we can do what's practically a magic trick by making it disappear. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to pour our magic liquid in this larger beaker. And you can see that there's liquid in there. Whoop, maybe that's too much. We'll see. And then uh, that's, uh, the magic liquid is mineral oil. And we're just going to try not to overflow here. Submerge this beaker, the little beaker, in the big beaker. And uh, I think you can see, and you can come up after class if you like, they can barely make out that there's a little beaker in there at all. It's almost like it just vanished completely. So why is that? Well, um, mineral oil, as it turns out, has an index of refraction itself, which is higher than the index of refraction of water, 1.33, and much closer, almost identical, to the index of refraction of the pyrex from which the beakers are made. So now, when light is coming from outside the big beaker, passing through the mineral oil, when it encounters the, um, when it encounters the little beaker, since it has exactly the same index of refraction, the light isn't bent at all. And it goes through the oil in the little beaker, and then out the beaker, little beaker again, then out through the oil. And uh, it just looks like there's this beaker here and not the little beaker inside because the light that's passing through the material inside the big beaker is not being bent at all. Now you can see the, the markings on the, um, the little beaker. But I, you know, you're welcome to come up after lecture and take a look at this. It's a pretty dramatic illustration of, of what happens. Now, we're going to replace this guy with um, this. And we're going to set it up so that the beam is hitting this at a, a good 90 degree angle. So there's no bending of the incoming beam. So now we're starting with a beam inside here. And as you can see, there's a reflected beam and a transmitted beam that's bent at an angle that we could calculate using Snell's law. But what about this internally reflected beam? Well, in general, when you have light, a beam of light incident on the boundary between two materials, it has an angle of incidence theta some of the light is reflected and some of the light is transmitted. As you can see by this demonstration, we've actually split our laser beam into two beams, a reflected beam and a transmitted beam. And the amount of reflection and the amount of transmission depends on the angle at which you've arranged them. Now, the angle of the reflected beam, theta 1, is exactly the same as the angle of the incident beam, theta 1. And that's just the you know, the basic rule of reflection that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. That's how we would say it. Now the angle of tra the transmitted beam, theta 2, compared to theta 1, fo still follows Snell's law. Now this is the case where N2 is greater than N1. 
In the case that we have here with the beam on the inside, we have N N1, the incident beam is greater than N2, the, the air here. So we've reversed the situations between the uh, illustration in the, in the uh, slide here and the actual demonstration. Now a very interesting thing can occur as you increase the angle of, uh, of incidence when you're going from a high to a low index of refraction material. And the reason is that you can't always satisfy Snell's law, right? So in this case, yeah, we have, we've set up a situation very much like what we have on the board there. But as we increase this angle, as we increase the angle of incidence, and I'm going to do that by turning this, you can see that the angle of the transmitted beam gets pretty large. And if I change it a little bit more, there is no more transmitted beam. That looks like magic. You know, how can you go, for, you know, shoot a beam of light at the surface and it doesn't escape somehow? Seems like magic, but it just follows directly from Snell's law that eventually the angle of incidence inside the higher, the material with the higher index of refraction is such that the light cannot get out because you just can't have a, a value for theta on the outside that works, that satisfies Snell's law. That's called total internal reflection. Now we can calculate what that angle is. We call it the critical angle and it's the angle beyond which uh, all the reflection is internal to the medium and there is no transmission. Okay, So beyond the critical angle you have total internal reflection. We can calculate this using Snell's law just by setting the output angle, if you want, uh, to theta over 2. Now that would be the situation in this case, for example, where if I go back a little bit, uh, the output angle here is pretty large, 60, 70 degrees, it's getting closer to 90 degrees right there. It's just sort of skimming the surface. You can't, can't really see it. Light is just barely making it out of the, the surface there. So in that case, theta 2 outside, uh, you know, in the lower index of refraction material, in this case the air, uh, is 90 degrees, pi over 2. So we set sine theta 2 to 1, and that's how we get this equation N1 times sine theta critical is equal to N2 because the sine theta 2 here we just set to 1. So sine theta critical is just N2 over N1. So that would be for, if that acrylic has a, an index of refraction of 1.6, then it would be 1 over 1 1.6 is sine theta critical. Clearly, N2 has to be less than N1 for this to happen. Now, next time you, you go to a pool and there's not too many other people around splashing, and if you, if you like to go underwater, try doing this. And uh, go underwater and sit, hold your breath, and look up at the surface. You may want to hold your nose because otherwise air will get out and start to you know, have trouble. But anyway, if you look at the surface above you, and then of course there's air above the surface, and look at the reflections that you see off the surface, you'll see that uh, beyond a certain angle you see everything, you don't see anything outside the pool. And if there's somebody standing next to the pool uh, waving at you, uh, if you get far enough away from them, well, just try it sometimes. It's a pretty interesting, it's something that people don't tend to do when you go underwater, you're always looking down and around. But if you look up, uh, it looks pretty strange. In fact, uh, if you're under a very still surface of water um, and you look up, you'll see a ring. And, you know, if, let's say you're in a pond and the bottom of the pond is dark, you'll see a bright ring for the sky and everything outside, and then you'll see darkness on the outside of that ring. And you can calculate what the angle of that, that ring is just from knowing the index of refraction of water. 
There's another interesting demonstration of total internal reflection. Uh, and we can take just this, again, a piece of acrylic and shoot the laser into it. And I'll try to hold it steady so you can see what happens. I think you can see the beam bouncing around inside there and then it shoots out the end. As I move the laser beam around, maybe it becomes clear. You could come up and try this after, after class yourself. And maybe you'll get a chance to do something like this in DL as well. This is the principle by which fiber optics work. And of course, uh, for fiber optics, they're going all over the place, around corners, up and down, through different rooms. So if, we, if I shoot this beam of light in the end here, it actually comes out the end over here. Not as a really coherent beam, it kind of gets uh, jumbled up a bit. But in a fiber optic cable, you're sending pulses of light or a signal on the light and it goes around and around and goes many, many kilometers before emerging at the other end. So the light is totally trapped inside the fiber optic. So you want a fiber optic that's very, very uh, transparent to the wavelength you're using so that you can transmit your signal over many, many uh, kilometers. And you want the light to be totally contained inside there. So what they found is the, the best situation is to have a thin fiber uh, it's made of a, of, of a kind of glass which is cladded, coated on the outside with a uh, lower index of refraction material to help keep the, the light inside. Now in transmitting uh, data over large distances, I don't know, you get maybe 100, 300, <coughs> something like that, kilometers before you have to take the signal out of the fiber and by that point, you know, it's been degraded a bit, and then you, you have what's called a repeater, which just puts the uh, you know, listens and puts the same signal out on a, a new, new set of fibers uh, moving on. So we have, for, our, for the internet in this country, is almost entirely based on fiber optics. And in fact, the internet connecting continents relies on fibers that go underneath the ocean. Cables, giant cables with thousands and thousands of optical fibers, and then repeaters deep under the ocean every uh, several hundred kilometers. I don't know the exact number, but that, that's how we do the internet. It's not done with satellites, okay? <laughs> satellites would take too long to, for the signal to go all the way out to, let's say, a geosynchronous satellite and then back down to the ground again. Uh, we do it with, with fiber optics. <coughs> 